Listen up. There's no more excuses. We're empowering those who want the hustle by exposing the status quo. The days of ordinary are over. It's time to crush mediocrity and start discovering your greatest potential. Welcome to the Hustle Nation. 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 Welcome back to another episode of the Hustle Nation podcast. Today, it's just Dustin and I, and we're going to talk about the evolution of leadership. So Dustin, we just had a pretty interesting conversation about being a leader of a company for more than a couple of years. And I think that message can oftentimes get stale and worn out. And we talked a little bit about how does that impact your team and your employees, the, the team morale and productivity. Um, you had a really interesting story about a recent interaction. I, I want to hear that story again. Yeah. So I was recently meeting with a, a, another CEO and we were having a conversation around leadership and our own leadership and our own companies and you know what we kind of saw in the world. And it was a really interesting conversation because one of the things we were talking about is kind of the typical shelf life of a CEO is, you know, seven to 12 years, maybe. Right. And, you know, as, as you mentioned, Chris, maybe in a public company, that's even shorter. Yeah. And, you know, maybe in some private companies, it's a little bit longer, but you know, the reason oftentimes that's the case is simply because they need to keep it fresh. And if you have the same leader for too long, you know, there's a huge risk of it being stale and not innovating and not recreating itself and things like that. And, uh, what I thought was really interesting about the conversation, uh, this, you know, this individual had actually been a uh, CEO at, at, or is CEO at his company for about, uh, 10 years. And, you know, he was talking about a lot of the different things that he was doing to, uh, you know, keep his organization fresh and uh, continue to innovate and, and adapt and things like that. And, you know, I said, you know, candidly, it was interesting for me because, you know, today, you know, I've been CEO for call it six years and, you know, really at, at McClellan, I mean, I could theoretically be CEO for another 30 years plus. And what does that mean? And, and I think it's an interesting thing as a leader, there's this weird balance where we want to, we want to create stability. We want to create, uh, you know, repeatable things, repeatable processes, repeatable differentiations. But then at the same point, we have to balance that with how do we continue to not only recreate our organizations, but how do we recreate ourselves as a leader on some cadence, right? You know, you don't want to, be changing your approach to everything every year. No one's going to understand what's going on with you. But, uh, you know, I think one of the things I, I shared was, you know, really what I've been trying to focus on is every kind of five year cycle, you know, myself going through a transition as if I'm a, a new leader and having fresh eyes on the organization, but also having our entire leadership team do the, do the same thing, our entire team for that matter, you know, kind of never settling, continuing to innovate. Uh, and continue to to challenge ourselves to kind of have those those fresh eyes. But how do you do that? And because, like you said, it's one thing to do almost a 180 every year, and then people look at you probably like you're crazy, like, "Whoa, what's the next big thing he or she is after?" So, how do you keep your finger on the pulse, both of what's happening in the organization, and then? you know, what does the company need? Because what your company needs today might be different than tomorrow. And the same, if we juxtapose your company versus my company. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of different ways to do it. I think step one is listening. You know, you yeah. always have new, new people coming into your organization. And we actually have a new uh, leader coming in into our company. And you know, this person walking in is going to have a long list of stuff that everyone <laughs> wants them to tackle, right? I mean, it, an infinite list in some way that there's no way they could probably tackle in a decade. But one of the one of the challenges, really, that 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 we've talked about with 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 her coming on board is before we prescribe what we think those things could be, give her the opportunity to be fresh eyes, tear our company apart. Yeah, you know, and and provide that feedback and giving that space. I think a lot of times when we bring new people in the organization, we're so focused on getting them to super productivity fast. And certainly in some positions that has to happen, right? But I think a lot of times as you're you're bringing on leaders, giving them a little bit of space 
to think and to challenge and to ask questions and to, uh, you know, not be so pushed to just, you know, the way I kind of talk about one degree it, right. Where you're, you're getting, you're getting your processes maybe one degree better because that fresh eyes opportunity, a lot of times could be a much steeper turn that, that drives much better results. So I think, I think a lot of it comes down to, to feedback and getting from other people. But I also think it has to do with the mindset of your organization. I think if you have an, an organization that is, uh, you know, kind of has a glass ceiling, they, they, they maybe want to grow, they maybe want to accomplish something, but they, they have kind of this bar. Um, I, you know, I think I was sharing with you, Chris, I went through this with our organization, you know, with, with McClone. By the end of next year, we'll probably be the size that six years ago I was hoping we were going to be by the time I retired. Right. So it's amazing. That was a mindset thing. Yeah. Right. And, and obviously now that's not the, that's not the goal. Right. Um, but I think we all fall into that. Right. We, we, we all look at just what's maybe a couple degrees ahead of where we are. When in reality, there's transformational stores all over the place. I, I was actually meeting with a, a large company uh, today. They've got uh, thousands of employees and, and, you know, they're looking to go from 3,000 people to 6,000 people. Wow. In the next couple of years. Well, that's not a hope. I mean, that's a plan. And I, yeah. I, I have no doubt that they're going to execute on that. And an abundance mindset. But that's exactly right. They're, they're not looking at it saying, well, I hope we grow by 5% next year, right? They're, they're looking at how, how, what, how are we going to double in a very short period of yeah. time? And, uh, and not doubling for double sake, right? It's, it's how are we uniquely creating value and challenging ourselves and continuing to innovate. So you know, I think a lot of it, you know, comes and so that to your point, that abundance mindset, the the thought process that let's not, you know, let's not be held back. You know, uh you know, one quote that I always think is is really interesting is uh basically the the defeatist of innovation is in the how. Mm, right. So that's a good one. You know, when people start asking about, well, how do we do this and how do we do that? Certainly there's a time to do that, but I think a lot of times really good ideas never come to fruition because we focus way too much on the how and, and then we just throw it away because we're like, well, I don't really know how we would do that. Well, perfection can be know. the enemy of production. hundred percent. Yeah. That's you know, kind of the same thing, right? So don't, don't let, uh, especially in, as you're thinking about strategy and long-term and innovation, you know, think, think about really the, the why and what it maybe should be figure out the how in the long run. You can, you know, most innovation, if you look at it, the, the how is in it, is, it's uh, iterated hundreds of times. Uh, but it yeah. starts with a kind of a crazy idea a lot of times. You know, you said something about that company that stuck out to me, which was they basically want to double their workforce. Now, to me, if I'm a part of an organization that has that kind of growth mindset, as a byproduct, you can't help but not be excited. You can't help but not have enthusiasm. And think about for a moment, what does that do for your productivity? What does that do for the morale of the team and the whole entire organization? It, I would argue that just the placebo effect of that says, oh, wow, I'm excited to come to work. I'm excited to be more productive. So to me, that's really important because if, if you juxtapose that to the opposite, and you and I have had conversations with leaders like this where it's like, you know, we don't really need to grow. We don't really need to do this or we're not looking for massive growth. I think what happens is you fall into a pitfall, an invisible pitfall, where you end up doing the same kinds of things over and over. You think maybe you're evolving. You think maybe I read a book and I'm trying something new, but ultimately it's just stale. And yeah. if you don't have a fresh perspective, if you don't have uh, new ways of growing, evolving, changing your leadership style, I think that that can wear on a team. And that may be part of the reason uh, there's such a high employee turnover these days where, you know, especially us, right? We're in our forties, um, especially the, the generation after us, we, we just tend not to want to change very much. And I think that that can have the opposite effect on our workforce and our team and certainly cascades through on all of our leadership and everything we do. Yeah. And I think sometimes that comes through by organizations losing their why, you know, when they say, well, I'm not really yeah. seeking growth. Well, what does that mean? I mean, if, if what you do really matters, well, 
why wouldn't you want to have more of that? Right? Like if, if I'm selling snake oil, growth then is for only for my own benefit. Right. But it, you know, for organizations that are really making an impact on others, which ultimately should be the goal of any organization, right? That's, you know, a lot of people, when they look at sales, they look, well, I just want to grow sales. Well, one of the easiest way to grow sales is grow your impact. You know, if you grow, grow your impact on your clients, more organizations or individuals are going to find you right now. You still got to tell the story, right? We talk a lot about marketing and sales and things like that, right? You can have the best thing in the world, but if nobody knows about it, that's not good either. But I think a lot of times that's where organizations start to stall out as they, you know, they lose their, whether that's their entrepreneurial mindset, whether that's their, uh, you know, client first mentality, whatever you want to call it, it, it starts with creating value for someone else that they can't get on their own. And how do you package that? How do you position that? And then how do you tell as many people about it? And, you know, to your point at, at the individual level, when people are coming to work, right, they spend more time at work than they spend with just about anyone else in, in their lifetime. Right. Well, guess what? They want what they do to matter. And if your only goal in life is, you know, growth or status quo or whatever, I mean, if, if you walk, you know, said differently, if you walk into an organization and you're there for 20 years and the way it was when you walked in and the way it was when you walked out is the same. You don't have a whole lot, lot to look back at and say, man, that was, that was really great. I'm really glad I dedicated 20 years of my life to that, right? If you apply that to anything other than work, right? If you, if you worked out like crazy for 20 straight years and you never got fit, <laughs> right? Like somebody would say that's crazy. It is. But, you know, a lot of times with work, people just kind of, kind of let it be. And, uh, you know, certainly some people would, would prefer some like high growth, uh, you know, organizations, some like frankly, less growth organizations. And so, you know, there are some call it cash cow, more status quo types of organizations that, that people might like to work in because it is a little bit more predictable, but it's I see that less and less. Predictability, though. That's it. Like it, there's, um, and in time, frankly, what we know is those organizations are typically short lived, right? If you look at business cycle, the cash yeah. cow time frame. It's only getting shorter and shorter in today's world because the minute there's an organization that has a cash cow model, people can move to it so much faster than they ever could. So organizations fall out of it that much faster. Yeah, there's uh, definitely a copycat world that we live in today. I want to go back to the why, though, for a moment, because I found that even in, in industries where the why not may, may not be very apparent, or may not even feel like, well, we're, we're a restaurant, we're a bank, like, what could our why possibly be? Well, you know, if you're in the financial world, or you're in the restaurant world, there are a lot of great whys from providing food that's both fresh and healthy, to a great dining experience, to transforming people's lives through financial responsibility, financial education. They're, they're, it's so important. And I think if your company really does stand for something, which I'd argue most do, and that's communicated both internally and externally, you're going to have people that want to work for you. You're going to have people that want to work with you as a client. Because I heard this old saying, and I'll probably get it wrong, but it goes back to our, our days in coaching, Dustin, where uh, it's, it goes something like, people don't care um, how much you know, they care how much you care. And I think mm -hmm. once you demonstrate that level of care, and you, don't, you demonstrate some level of knowledge, you'll have your students or potentially your customers eating all out of the palm of your hand. And that's just something today, I think, when we talk about why and care, we don't see that as much, especially in the service industry. And I think you just have a disproportionate advantage when you have a very visible why and a very visible care. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, beyond organizationally, I think individually, we've talked about this a lot, right? A lot of people have set goals up, but they don't have a strong enough why to really motivate them, right? You know, if, if I just, I want to lose 10 pounds, well, why? It's not going to change my life. It's not going to, maybe it's going to make me marginally healthier or something. I don't know, but depending on how I lose it, I guess, right? If it's just water weight, it doesn't really do a whole lot of good. But uh, yeah, I think you're exactly right. And I think a lot of times people underestimate that the impact that they can have, which I think is why it's hard for them to find their why. 
you know, if it, the, the why a lot of times uh, you can be, it can be found by talking to your customers, right? So you talk about it like a, you know, a restaurant as an example. Um, you know, my wife and I are this way. I mean, there's, there's certain restaurants we love to go to because it's like our cheers. It's not, it's not because they have the best food or they have the most amazing drinks or whatever. Certainly we like some of those restaurants too. And if it was terrible, you know, we won't want to do it. Right. But you know, there are some restaurants where you're going where that's, you know, the, the food and the, the, the drinks or the atmosphere is really what it is. In other cases, it's the experience because it's, they're super friendly. We were, we were in a, it was pure Wisconsin. Uh, we were in a, a, a dive bar uh, in the middle of middle Wisconsin uh, this past, past weekend. And uh, the bartender there, she was incredible. Uh, she was, uh, it was probably in her like mid to late fifties. She had worked there for a while. Uh, we were kind of the out of towners that were, were stopping by and man, she knew, you know, I don't know that she would have articulated that she knew her why, but she knew her why. And her why was to make sure that everybody in that place was having a good time. And she was, she would, she was engaging. She was conversational. She was sarcastic. She, you know, it, it, it was, it was unbelievable. Right. And it was this, you know, there's probably 12 people outside of us in that bar. Uh, but you know, there's no doubt when she, when she goes to work, you know, she didn't have to do any of that. She could have completely ignored us, given us a drink and called it a day. But you know, that's, that was her, that was her why. And, you know, to your point, yeah, that, that, if I went to that bar's website, they probably don't even have a website, number one and number two, they probably don't have a, you know, mission vision statement and things like that. But you know, that individual, she showed it. But she took care of you. And as a exactly byproduct, right. probably made some pretty good tips that night. She did. She did. Yeah. Which I, I love. Um, I think as we talk about that, we wrap those things together. It just makes so much sense. But when we talk about evolution of leadership. I think it's so important. I mean, obviously, we all strive to be a great leader. But I think as part of being a great leader comes with evolution. And one of the things I always say, coming from marketing background, is that I get the question a lot about change. So algorithms change, platforms, trends, all these things. And I've actually said that I, I've learned to embrace change and I've learned even further to love change. And I think the reason being is that the more change there is, and the more rapid changes in the world. And if you are willing to be an early adapter, if you're willing to say, oh, that's interesting, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to research that and I'm going to try to implement something like that in my company, you could have a disproportionate advantage. Mm -hmm. um, because times change, right? We're only going to get older, but our workforce that we lead is only going to continue to get younger. And so the more we can evolve and provide a better experience and a better work environment, I think the better we are for it. So what I'm getting at ultimately is you can't get comfortable. You really have to continue to evolve and grow and get excited about that. Because to me, I love the challenge. I love the opportunity of trying to adapt to something or learn a new technology, learn a new tool. And it, it's only going to make you and your workforce better. Do you agree with that? Yeah, 100%. I mean, you know, change is opportunity, uh, right? I mean, that's kind of the age old adage, but I think, um, you know, even more specifically, external change creates opportunity, right? And so, uh, you know, I think those leaders, those organizations, that not only see those things, but also communicate those things. So, you know, I, I use an example, uh, you know, years ago in our business, you know, McClone were in the employee benefit space and uh, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act came out. Well, that, that was a tremendous amount of change that a lot of people didn't know what it was, what impact it was going to have. Well, for us, it ended up being a tremendous opportunity because so many people were confused by it. They needed help. Right. And we were able to kind of guide them through that, walk them through that. Uh, but think of it today. Think of uh, all the AI tools today. Right. It's a I lot. Mean, you're more advanced this than I am. Right. I've learned a, a ton from you in this in this category. But I think that's part of the piece is is constantly learning from others on what's that next thing. And, you know, we've we've talked a little bit about AI. I mean, AI is an interesting thing because. There's going to be a lot of people that's going to tool chase, right? They're just they're going to buy every AI thing that they can think of because you know it's 
that's the next cool tool. It's the next shiny tool. But I think that, you know, the most innovative people, when they're looking at change, they're looking at, you know, kind of through the lens of what is the external change? How do I tie that into the value that I create for my, for my clients, right? And my team. And when you have those kind of two lenses, then a lot of this change tends to reveal itself pretty clearly, right? So if you think of, you know, AI, rather than just chasing a tool or technology, you know, what, what's the, the, the next one or two that you could maybe implement that would help you create more value for your team or for your clients? And if you have that lens as opposed to just, oh, well, this is cool, uh, which I feel like any new technology, that's the way it is. And I'm, I'm just as guilty, right? Like sometimes I'm, I'm looking at this stuff. I'm like, oh, it can, it can build me a meal plan. Okay, but that doesn't do anything if I'm not going to follow it. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> right. so that's great. But, well, okay, but it can't do that. But it, maybe it can do these other four or five things. Or here's something we're already doing that takes us, you know, three hours. Now it can take us a half an hour. And we can tweak it from there. And oh, by the way, that frees us up to spend this much more time on this other thing that, frankly, is a lot more valuable to our customers. Yeah. I think you can be very quick to dismiss new ideas, new technology like AI. I've heard so many people say, well, I'm never going to use that or I don't really (laughs) care for AI. And I'll say things like, well, did you know there's AI built into almost everything? Uh, Think about Alexa and Google Home and Nest cameras and all these other technologies we already use, it's out there and it's plentiful. So rather than say, I'm not gonna, or I don't like it, why don't you think about the opportunities where you could implement it? And you could have a very intelligent conversation with your team and discover, yeah, maybe the timing's not right, but along the way we've learned something about how we might potentially want to start using it. And I I just think there's a lot to think about there. And um, like you said before, really wanting to learn, wanting to adapt. I find that sometimes we got to step out of our comfort zone and, you know, have conversations with other leaders to to determine what, what are different ways that you're running your company that I could do the same with mine. And so learning from others has been something where we have to be vulnerable and willing to have those conversations. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Awesome. Well, Dustin, great conversation today. I, I love the topic and let's do it again soon. Sounds good. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a great day. Peace. Thank you for being part of the Hustle Nation. If you're serious about raising the bar in your personal and professional life and willing to go all in on your success, head over to hustleleaders.com. Here you can get access to our Hustle Productivity ebook, attend our Hustle Masterclass, or challenge yourself to the 30 day Hustle Challenge. Pairing these tools and training with the Hustle Nation podcast will help you advance to a whole new level. Until next time, stay hungry and inspire those around you to hustle.